Hello, Healthy 30 students. This is Brian Clark. This is lecture two of two on chapter number 15. We will pick up with the information on special needs for preterm infants. And uh, ideally, if, a, if an infant does have the ability to breastfeed, uh, it needs to be doing so. However, in addition to breastfeeding uh, for preterm babies, uh, and especially ones that are, um, are are not of adequate size for their gestational age, uh, they are going to need uh, fortified milk, uh, preterm fortified formula, and a neonatal neonatal nurse can certainly help you out with that. All right, moving on. Uh, this first bullet point is very important uh, for infants. They should not be drinking cow's milk during their first year of life. Uh, cow's milk contains fairly high levels of the protein casein uh, that can cause intestinal bleeding, which of course can cause gastrointestinal distress, and that and the bleeding can cause anemia. So uh, do not include cow's milk in an infant's diet during that first year. However, around the first birthday, you can start slowly incorporating cow's milk. And during that, uh, that time between one and two years of age, uh, the, the, ch the child should be drinking a fairly significant amount, two to three cups of cow milk per day. Uh, however, after that second birthday, you can start reducing the fat content. If you want to start going to 2% and then ultimately to 1%, that's okay. Uh, solid food should be introduced around four to six months. And uh, I'm going to skip down here just a little bit and um, go to the bullet point that you see in red. Oftentimes, it is hard to get infants to eat um, to eat their vegetables. However, regardless of how hard it is to get them to eat their vegetables, uh, never add sugar or salt. That is, um, that, that's an absolute, uh, it's a, something that absolutely should not be happening. Um, I'm going to skip back up to the second bullet point now. Sorry for jumping around on that slide, but um, I did want to point out uh, the information about no salt, no additional salt or sugar because it is very important. Uh, do also want to emphasize that it's important to introduce, introduce foods uh, individually. You don't want to introduce multiple foods at one time due to the the uh, possibility of a histamine response. Uh, another way of saying that is um, due to the risk of an allergic response. And uh, by inter introducing foods individually, you will lower the risk of the, the child forming a food allergy. Uh, moving on to the information on iron. Um, iron, iron fortified cereals with vitamin C, uh, they should be included in the infant's diet. Um, foods with vitamin C, um, certainly just about any type of vegetable, um, certainly um, fruits are going to have vitamin C as well, and actually your, your fruits are going to be higher in vitamin C content than are many of the vegetables. Um, it is important to set limits on those fruit juices because, um, uh, of course, the fruit, juice, fruit juices can lead to tooth decay. Some foods to omit, and um, in the society that we live in, these are probably more important. Uh, certainly, concentrated sweets. You know, there, there's no need to give a a one-year-old uh, a candy bar. That's just not appropriate. <clears throat> um, products with added sugar alcohols, such as sorbitol. Uh, can, canned vegetables are no-nos because they, they contain too much salt. Um, honey. Honey is also something that you should not be feeding to infants due to the risk of botulism. And um, just in general, need to be watching foods that can potentially be choking hazards. And that list can, of course, be, uh, be significantly longer than it is. <clears throat> I'll uh, just very quickly say that there is a risk of um, of malnutrition for uh, vegetarians, and sometimes vegetarians feel that 
the need to um, to instill that type of ideology into their children, and there certainly there certainly is a, a tremendous amount of benefit to living or eating a vegetarian diet. However, there's also risk that goes along with that when an infant um, and or a child eats a vegetarian diet. There's a sample menu that you can see in your your text. Now, moving on to the information about nu nutrition during childhood. Um, energy needs, they vary dramatically depending upon physical activity. So um, some of the, the general recommendations that you see in your text, keep in mind that those are variable depending upon the amount of, the amount of physical activity that a child is getting. Um, right there you see some some general recommendations uh, or, or general um, information as it relates to how much energy or how much how many calories a child is burning based upon their age and as I said that that, that does vary tremendously uh, carbohydrates and fiber uh, we, we live in a we live in a society where a very significant portion of the carbohydrates that we eat are refined. The more highly refined a carbohydrate is, the less fiber it contains. The less fiber a carbohydrate contains, the harder it is to ultimately move that food through the gastrointestinal system that can cause constipation. So eating foods that are less refined, such as, as whole vegetables, um, they, they are, they are going to contain significantly greater amounts of fiber and that is is much health, healthier for the gastrointestinal system. Uh, do want to point out a general trend here and that you'll notice that as a child ages that the need for fat is reduced. Uh, you'll see there that children one to three years of age should have somewhere between 30, 40, 30 to 40 percent of their energy needs met from dietary fat. However, as a child gets older, that percentage is reduced. And um, it's important to, to keep that in mind that uh, as a child gets older, the need for fat does decrease. Uh, I want to point out a very useful website, and that is mypyramid.gov and um, if you type in mypyramid.gov it's going to take you to this, this website here and if you click on kids and then uh, preschoolers again there's this really neat tool and unfortunately the day that I am rec recording this it is down <laughs> but um, and, and there's a notice here saying that it's down but if you click on my, my pyramid plan you can enter your child's name, gender, age, answer a few questions, and it's going to make some some general recommendations about dietary intake. And it is a, a really nice interactive tool, and I, I recommend using it. Uh, nope. Okay, there you see table 15-4. Um, that's some some general recommendations, and uh, I'll I'll make uh, make a slightly more specific recommendation. Focus on uh, focus on getting your children to eat their grains and vegetables. Uh, it's much easier to get them to eat these the fruits and of course the meats and the milk and the oils. We really don't have to worry about because there's plenty of those in our food. So if you focus on getting your children to eat a, a varied diet uh, with a focus on, on grains, whole grains, and vegetables, uh, these others have a tendency to fall into place fairly easily. There's some of those estimated daily caloric intakes I was telling you about before that have a tendency to vary wildly depending upon the amount of physical activity that a child gets. Uh, some information I want to highlight about hunger and malnutrition is that brain function 
is dramatically affected by malnutrition. Um, when a person is malnourished, fairly qu quickly we're going to see that person become anemic. But even before we can do a blood test and, and tell that that person is anemic, brain function has already been affected. So, as you can well imagine, uh, for a child uh, who is um, who is in, a, in an academic setting, in a school setting on a daily basis, and is malnourished, they're not going to perform as well. So, uh, eating a healthy breakfast prior to going to school is absolutely necessary. Uh, if you live in a house that was built before 1977, lead based paint may have been used uh, that paint has a tendency to peel children they're they are constantly putting things in their mouth so if you have peeling paint in a house that you feel is older or was built prior to 1977 uh, you, you need to take some some pretty major and uh, and quick action to make sure that that um, that peeling paint is taken care of such that there's not a risk that uh, that a child is ingesting that paint food allergies uh, somewhere between three to five percent of children are diagnosed with a food allergy and uh, they can be severe they can cause anaphylactic shock uh, luckily epinephrine injections take care of those fairly easily so if you have a child that does have a, a, a severe food allergy carry, carrying an EpiPen or making them carry an EpiPen um, is, is certainly recommended and uh, there are some some relatively common food allergies milk egg peanuts uh, those are the ones that you're usually going to see kids being allergic to now now we're going to move into some more uh, relevant information and i hate that we're just about out of time but um childhood obesity is is an enormous issue in our society and i'm, I'm not going to necessarily talk specifically about these individual bullet points but i do want to emphasize that um uh, that it, that, it, that childhood obesity is a condition that negatively affects the health of that child for a lifetime um these children are oftentimes shorter they suffer from diabetes type 2 they uh, and, and um, let me cl let me clarify my point about them being shorter it's not unusual for them to be taller early how so they grow taller early in their their life but they stop growing they stop growing and ultimately end up being shorter than they otherwise would be um, uh, they have a tendency to suffer from chronic disease such as diabetes type 2 high blood pressure cardiovascular disease and um, those chronic diseases stay with them for a lifetime so addressing childhood obesity early is the key and unfortunately the intervention program the success of the intervention programs are just absolutely abysmal so uh, ideally the best way to deal with childhood obesity is to prevent it and ways to prevent it uh, primarily are be, be involved be interactive help your children to make good decisions uh, encourage them to be physically active uh, minimize uh, minimize how often they're eating out eating um, traditional fast food meals because those are all things that will contribute to childhood obesity which as I said will contribute to chronic disease later in life All right, um, just about out of time here. Let me see if there's a couple more items I want to touch on. I want to conclude by talking about alcohol use in adolescence. It's not unusual at all for adolescents, adolescents to start experimenting with alcohol. And it's important that they understand that alcoholic beverages are empty calories. They contain virtually no vitamins, no minerals, and when those beverages are being ingested, they are displacing nutritious nutritious foods that otherwise may be eaten during or nutritious drinks that may be 
be drank. And it doesn't take uh, displacing those nutritious foods for an extended period of time before there are health consequences. All right, in the interest of time, I'm going to end there. Thank you.